Asia is trying to come up with a new sustainable growth model. Where does it turn to for its philosophical inspiration, if you like? Well, I think Asia Pacific uh, depends even more than the whole world, actually primarily now, not on what's going on in Europe or even America, but China. I think China is, is, is the pivot, is, is, is the key, uh, increasingly to the whole world economy, because actually the demand growth every year in China is now equal or larger to the demand growth in the United States, although China is still only about half the size of the United States in its overall uh, economy. If you look at the growth of the economy, it's bigger in China than it is in the US. So it's true of the world as a whole, but it's particularly true of Asia because Asia, a other Asian economies are basically either suppliers of natural resources to China or part of a production chain which is increasingly oriented around China with uh, components and uh, subcontracting going out to the rest of Asia. So I think China is the uh, driver, the engine of the Asian economy. And I think it's increasingly also the model uh, in terms of development, more so than the, than the United States and Europe, the kind of lessons that China uh, is uh, suggesting for other, uh, especially ec developing economies that are further down the uh, development line than China, uh, are extremely relevant. Now, obviously, for the richer um, Asian economies like uh, South Korea or here in Hong Kong or Singapore, uh, what's going on in China is not going to be a model in terms of um, economic uh, management. Uh, but I think for the large Asian economies, China will remain, uh, ev well, be will become even more than it was before under the old Washington consensus. I think China will be, uh, if you like, the home of a Beijing consensus where the Chinese way of running the economy is increasingly seen as a model rather than the American approach. What are the key components of that Beijing uh, consensus? What are the key components of the Chinese economic model then, in your opinion? There's really one key to it, which is that uh, the market and the government must work together rather than being seen as completely separate domains which should, as far as possible, uh, be segregated through policy. Essentially, the, uh, the, the, the post uh, 1970s, what George Soros has called market fundamentalist approach, what I called in my book Capitalism uh, 4.0, the third era of capitalism that really began with Thatcher Reagan in 79-80, believed that government and market should be kept as separate as possible and that the solution to all economic problems was to create the, a level playing field, a competitive le a playing field in the market keep the government out of it, and then let market forces prevail. I think what China has shown is that certainly at China's stage of development, and I would argue in, in my book even further on, even in advanced economies, there has to be a collaboration between the market and the government. For 90% of economic decisions, pure competition, pure market forces, are the right way to go, and I think that's what China discovered from 1978 onwards. But for roughly 10% of economic decisions, which are absolutely crucial, the market cannot make uh, the, uh, the right allocation of resources, it cannot decide on the right direction of capital, or if you let it do it, it creates boom-bust cycles like the ones that, that, that we saw culminating in 2008. So I think what, uh, if you like, the Beijing consensus if, if, if it succeeds, is going to be about is identifying where it is that political decision making has to intervene over pure market decision making, and that's in macroeconomic policy, it's environment policy, it's in certain aspects of technological uh, uh, development, uh, it's possibly also in the distribution of income. If all these things are left purely to the market, they lead both to slow growth and to boom-bust cycles of a highly destabilizing kind. I just want to pick up on one thing you said about that 10% mm -hmm. where this combination has to work of policy and market forces. Yes. You mentioned the environment. At the Fung Global Institute, we're very concerned about sustainable growth. How can that combination really work to prevent environmental degradation around the region, which has already had a mixed record, let's face it? 
Well, I think pure market forces don't work in environmental policy for a combination of reasons. I'd say the two most important ones are the classic thing of external effects, uh, that the impact of environmental damage, uh, the biggest impact is usually not on the parties who are generating the environmental damage. That's a well-known economic uh, imperfection, uh, but it's a fact, and you can't just say, well, if only markets were perfect and we can make them a little more perfect, it will solve it, because th th that is impossible in the real world. But the second, I think, even bigger issue is that the timescales involved in both environmental damage and in the correction of that environmental damage run into decades, uh, if not longer. They don't run into months and years. And uh, pure uh, private uh, markets, especially ones that are dominated by, uh, where, where the uh, allocation of capital is uh, decided by uh, financial uh, incentives, are not, I think, by their very nature, able to take the sort of long-term decisions running into 20, 30, 40 years uh, that are required for the development of new technologies and in the energy field, or in internalizing the costs of environmental damage, which, as I said, accumulate over very, very long periods. So I think for those reasons, uh, the market alone cannot be uh, relied on to uh, deal with environmental problems. The trouble is the government alone can't be relied on either because all kinds of well-known pr problems ranging from uh, corruption and short-termism in government, which in some ways can be even more severe than short-termism in markets, uh, to the inability of government uh, officials or politicians to make the resource allocation decisions uh, that, that are required. You know, they're not qualified and, and they don't have the kind of experimental approach that comes out of markets and venture capital. So you need some kind of combination of market forces and long-term political vision interacting. Now, how exactly that can be done, not only can I not summarize it in a few seconds, but I don't know the answer. I don't think anybody does know the answer. But I think what is clear is that the answer will depend on some form of partnership between political decision-making and purely market-based decision-making, and not one or the other.